homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Napmo atasa bhagavato varahato asamma sambuddhasa Napmo atasa bhagavato arahato asamma sambuddhasa Napmo atasa bhagavato arahato asamma sambuddhasa Buddhang damang sankhang namasami So today is the seventh day of us <clears throat> practicing the Dhamma. And so we've probably experienced some level of happiness, of joy, a sense of fullness of heart. And studying the Dhamma is for the purpose of giving benefit, of benefiting our hearts, of bringing our minds to coolness. And when the mind is cool, then the people who are close to us, they will also experience this coolness as well. But we need to understand that when we begin to study the Dhamma, to practice the Dhamma, um, that it doesn't just happen very quickly. And that this practice of the Dhamma, it takes time. It's just like how, when we were young, it took time for us to grow up, and it's not easy. So, for us practitioners, we need to forbear, we need to bring up this power of kanti. And sometimes uh, mindfulness is good, and sometimes it's not so good. And maybe we hear about the Four Noble Truths, and um, we understand them to a degree. And so we don't want to suffer. And for us practitioners, we just want for there to be good things within our minds. And this is the problem of a practitioner. Because if we just want for there to be good things, um, that brings up difficulty because we're still practicing, because we're not yet arahants. So our minds aren't just filled with good things. We're still kalyana chanas, those who have good minds, who have beautiful minds. So we're still working on developing generosity and virtue and meditation. But we also have these uh, defilements which push us, which coerce us. And so when there is something that we don't like, then we don't wish for it to have that. We don't want to get that. We don't want to be like that. So like if a feeling of anger comes up, or hate, or fear, or love, we don't like this. But not liking this is not correct. It's not the right way. Because that's vipava uh, tanha this craving to not have, to not be. So if there's something that we like, then kama tanha comes up, uh, this desire uh, to have more of that. And if it's something that we dislike, and then there's uh, vipava tanha. So there are three kinds of this craving. There's kama tanha, this uh, desire for sensuality. And there's bhava tanha, this craving to be, to have. Vipava tanha, craving to not be, to not have. So when there's something that we like and we feel attracted towards that, we start liking it, then kama tanha comes up. There's a certain sense of gratification that we get from that experience, and so we want more. Uh, but we want more and it never feels like it's enough, and that's a cause for suffering to arise. But when we get something that we don't like, then there's this vipava tanha, this craving not to be, not to have. So like when we receive words of praise, we like those. But words of criticism or gossip, we dislike that. So when we get something that we like, then we feel this happiness there, this kamatanha, 
if there's something that we dislike and we feel sad, we don't want to have that, then that's vipa vatanha. So we need to be training our minds to, um, with all of these experiences that we receive in this present moment. Because when we receive them, then normally we feel gratification in that or a dislike towards it. And for practitioners, we want to have samadhi. We want to be wise. We want to experience maga and pala very quickly. And it's this desire that creates um, turbulence in the mind that makes them chaotic. And so practitioners can really feel like, oh, this, this practice, it's a lot of suffering, it's really difficult. And even when we experience happiness, we can wonder, well, I'm happy, but is this really the right way? And so doubts come up. And we want to get things quickly, but this wanting things uh, fast can bring up a lot of doubts, and these doubts make the mind chaotic. <laughs> and this can carry on and carry on until eventually we think, well, I just don't have the barami to do this. I just don't have the good fortune. It'd be better to give up. And a lot of practitioners have gone this way. They've stopped walking on this path to Nibbana. There are many who have been through this. But if we endure first, then we can persist. And so this endurance or forbearance, it's the quality of true practitioners. It's the quality of wise beings, of those who have effort to destroy the defilements. So we need to um, set ourselves on training, training these minds, on developing mindfulness, on developing wisdom. And sometimes there can be some samadhi that arises, some happiness that comes from that. And then we see clearly through our own experience that samadhi is like this, that we gain a happiness, a fullness of heart. And it's not like the happiness that we gain, or the joy, the delight that we get from gaining things in this world, uh, from gaining praise or status or pleasure. Because all of these things, we should be aware that they have their opposites, they come in pairs. So there's also loss, there's also this loss of status, of censure and of displeasure. And these worldly dhammas, these eight worldly dhammas, they're like a rotten stump. And if we sit leaning against that stump, then we can fall really hard when it breaks apart. So it's a dangerous situation. So we need to come to train our minds well so that we can contemplate all of the things that enter into our hearts, that we can know these worldly dhammas of uh, gain and loss, of praise and censure, of status, loss of status, of pleasure and pain. And these worldly dhammas are things that we use in the world. And, but for the most part, people don't really have much understanding around them. When they gain something, then they feel happy, they like that. But do they know that these things are of the nature to change? They are anicca, and they are dangerous for our hearts. So we need dhamma, we need these uh, helpful qualities, such as samadhi. We see that when samadhi arises, then there's this inner contentment and happiness that comes from that. And we can compare it to other kinds of happiness that we've felt before. And we see that it's very different. We see that there's much more energy, there's much more fullness there. So however much samadhi we have, to that degree we will lose our interest in things 
outside of us in the world, like those who can get into jhanas, into these states of absorption. And there's such peace and stillness and joy that arises that the mind is on the level of a Brahma. There's this um, kindness and compassion and sympathetic joy and equanimity there within the heart for those people who can get into samadhi like this. And so there's no real interest in things outside. And they see external things as just being kind of a mess. They're just chaotic. That the more we have, the more we're burdened down by these things. Like if we have a really large house, then we've got a lot of duties. We have to take care of that. We have to clean it. And if we have so many things to look after, then it's difficult to find peace of heart because we have to be so tied up and involved with external things. So I'll give an example that there was one uh, life where Ananda was a hermit and he would get into deep, deep states of jhana. And during that life, he was the uh, teacher of our Buddha, who was a bodhisattva then. And so it's normal for a bodhisattva, and he was a king as well in that life, to have a very beautiful queen, a very beautiful wife. And so this rishi, Ananda, this rishi, he um, would teach meditation to the king. But, and he had samadhi, but it's also normal that over the course of time, samadhi will deteriorate, it will degrade. And he developed a liking, an attraction, a love towards the queen, who was the wife of his student. And what could he do? He wasn't able to eat, he wasn't able to sleep. And the samadhi which he once had and which he taught about um, had degraded already. And so when that happens, then all of these sense experiences are able to pour into the heart, and sometimes we're just not able to get them out, that they stay there for a really long time. So the Bodhisattva knew what was going on, and he said that he would give the queen to his teacher. But he also said, before I do that, I want you to build a house for the both of you to live in. And you have to work on that house. You have to oversee its construction as well. And then after that, I will give you the queen. So as uh, Ananda in that life was working on this house, then in no long time his samadhi uh, was, had deteriorated a lot. It just kept going down and down and his mind became more and more unsettled and chaotic. And eventually he saw that, well, it's being involved in external things. It's this chaotic, it's this difficult, there's not just pleasure and delight here. So he saw the drawbacks of these sense experiences, and he went back into the forest and developed jhanas again. So samadhi gives us one kind of happiness, but it's not the quelling of defilements. For our Buddha, uh, before he became awakened, he could get into very high states of jhana. But when he came out of these, as he eventually did, then he would think once more about his wife, about his child, that there'd be worry there within his heart. And so even though there was a lot of happiness in those states of jhana, he had to come out again and think these thoughts again. And even though there was just a little bit of chaos there in his mind, it wasn't a lot, but still that little amount felt like a lot of suffering for him. <laughs> so samadhi does give us great happiness. And it's also extremely meritorious uh, for those people who can do it. You see that there, 
is a certain kind of happiness um, that comes from having wealth in this world. And there's another kind of happiness that comes from having samadhi. But this is still a worldly samadhi. And what we mean by worldly is that it's something that changes, it's not stable, and it's normal for it to be that way. Because that's the nature of things in the world, um, no matter which world it is, you know, whether it's the world of, of sensuality, or the form realms, or the formless realms. And that even in these realms where beings um, abide in these states of jhana, that there is still, um, you still have to come out of that. And there's still craving there within the heart, this craving for sensuality, this craving to be and become, to not be, to not become, and to not have. And that's the cause for suffering to arise. So this is something that we should contemplate, uh, seeing how um, this we get these feelings and this goes on to um, craving and to clinging. And what's that like? How does that feel? So when we come to cultivate samadhi, we should put down all external things and give rise to internal peace. But this inner peace, this samadhi that we gain, that is also something which is unsure. So when that deteriorates, we have to develop it once more. So samadhi is the samatha kamatana, this tranquility meditation. We can contemplate death as well and recite to ourselves how life is not sure, but death is sure. Death is the culmination of this life. This life must end in death. And through that recollection of death, we can get into upajara, or neighborhood samadhi. And we can think about the Buddha, and recollect his great compassion, how that was boundless, how it's endless. And we feel like praising the virtues of the Buddha it's like a tiny bird chirping in uh, the great universe. But through that, we can also enter into upajara samadhi. Or we re can recollect our generosity, our virtue. We can recite buddho. And so we just carry on doing that in our hearts. I repeat buddho, 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 like this. And then joy can come up and fill up the heart. And we can get into Upajara Samadhi as well. We can chant Itipiso, recollection of the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. Now for most of us, we recollect the Buddha. And but for those people who have a lot of wisdom and they like the Dhamma, they can recollect that, develop Dhamma Nusati. So this is all for the purpose of bringing our minds into peace, for developing either kanaka or upajara samadhi. But we should also uh, know that um, if this, this is the highest level that these can lead to. It's either kanaka or upajara samadhi. And this upajara samadhi is um, close to peace. It's like we are traveling into a city and we're close to that city, we're right outside the door. We're just about to enter. So upajara samadhi is close to stillness, to peace. And when we can develop this samadhi, then we are developing samatha kamatana. We can also develop metta as well, the four brahma viharas. Or contemplate into the four elements, this too is samatha practice, is tranquility practice. But sometimes people can recollect uh, death. And even though what they're doing is bringing up perception, um, it can really feel like true wisdom is arising. And through this perception of uh, physical and mental things being um, inconstant or impermanent and stressful and not self. 
And we may think that that is vipassana, that's insight, because there's a great sense of ease and we feel like we're letting go of things. But the reality is that that's still samatha practice, it's still tranquility. It's still a method which brings our mind to peace. But there's no need to worry then you think, well, is wisdom going to arise for this? And some people think that if we just develop samatha, then we'll just be stupid, we won't develop any wisdom. Because what's important is the energy of our minds. And if our minds don't have this energy of peace, then is vipassana, is insight, really going to be able to arise? Even though we may see some things, it's not clear. It's like we've just got a blunt knife and we're not able to cut things with it. So this tranquility gives us energy and allows us to sharpen this knife of wisdom. So whatever the case, we should set our hearts on the practice. And some people, and and we take the samadhi to contemplate and to reality, like how the Buddha taught about dependent origination. Like when the eye sees a form, then the defilements can arise right there. And we use this samadhi to contemplate how this is something which is unstable, it's not sure. If we think that a certain kind of food is really delicious, we really like it, we tell ourselves this isn't sure. We'll try eating it every single day, are we still going to like it then? It's not sure. These bodies of ours, they're not sure. We can think that they're strong right now, but that's not sure. So we just keep telling ourselves, not sure, not sure, not sure. And here, the Dhamma will arise. And when change really happens, then we see that that, that really is how it is. We know. We, we've known already that this is not sure because we've been telling ourselves such. And so we see things as um, being this way, as being unstable, as being not sure, because that's just the nature of the world, it's an unsure place. And people who are born into this world, there's none of them can stay on, that nothing in this world lasts, no one's able to stay forever. And so we see that this, again, it's unstable, it's not sure. So through doing this, we're contemplating into anicca, dukkha, anatta, and these are the objects of vipassana, which allow for wisdom to arise. And some people can use wisdom to develop samadhi. We can contemplate so that samadhi arises. And then when, and when we've contemplated, then the mind should feel peaceful and still, it should gather together. And then when it starts to flow outwards again, it starts to embellish, starts to create things, Um, then we are on top of that, we know what's going on. And we can see those creations of the mind cease. But if we are watching our minds, and they're thinking and thinking, they're creating, embellishing, and they just keep going without stop, we can tell ourselves, or we can think to ourselves that I've got mindfulness and I'm looking at my mind, I know what's going on. And this is the problem of people who are trying to take up this practice of just watching the mind. (laughs) There's all these thoughts going on, the mind, it's loving, it's hating, it's uh, maybe worried or fearful. And we tell ourselves, well, I know this, I know this love, I know this fear, I know this hate. But we're not able to solve that, we're not able to fix it. And that shows that the energy of our samadhi is very little. Our mindfulness is weak. And so the mind can just go on thinking, proliferating, all throughout the day. And we can be aware to a certain degree, but the mind doesn't stop thinking. It doesn't um, come to stillness. And this shows that our mindfulness is weak. 
But if our mindfulness is strong, then we'll be able to see all of these sensory experiences, these sense impressions. We'll know if there's greed, hatred and delusion in the mind or if they're absent. And the mind will stop doing that. It will stop thinking, it will stop proliferating. So there's one experience that I had that I'd like to share. And there was one time I was um, contemplating the body as being elements and seeing how all people must die. And so I saw um, a dead body, but I didn't see it as being a person or the body of a person. I just saw it as just being one kind of life. But there was no being there, there was no person there. And so this was um, samatha, the mind had gathered into stillness. But then when my mind started proliferating again, and it gave rise to this perception of a person, um, this wisdom came up and that really uh, there isn't a person there. And it came up without my intending for that to happen. It was immediate. It just knew um, right as that was happening and to the nature of conventions. And when we see conventions for what they are, then vimuti, liberation, arises. There's brightness, there's clarity. We know that the arising of the Dhamma is like this. You see how there's no being, no individual person, me or you, there. Form is just form, a body is just a body. It's just the conventions um, that we create that give rise to this perception of body, of a being. But in truth, it's not a being, not an individual, not me, not you. There's no female there, there's no male there, there's no anything there. It's just a collection of natural elements, just elements following the course of nature. So understanding the Dhamma is like this. And we may, and it comes from the wisdom that arises from our meditation, from mental cultivation, from bhavana. So when we listen to something, there can be a certain degree of knowledge, but it doesn't go in deep. It's just very surface level. And we may think about it and then get more acceptance um, about that particular thing but it still doesn't get to the heart of the matter. But it's when we know with wisdom that we enter into the heart of the Dhamma, and the mind becomes bright, this joy arises. Even though we didn't expect for that to happen, we didn't think that we would gain wisdom. It's just that the mind gathers into peace and wisdom arises right then. We see people walking about, but we don't see them as being people. And that's what happened when wisdom comes up. So there was, there was um, one senior monk um, during the time of the Buddha, and he was walking in a forest, and close by um, there was a husband who was arguing with his wife, and so the wife decided to leave. And she walked past this monk along this path. And then later, when the husband went out looking for his wife, he asked this monk, have you seen my wife? But when this monk, um, when the woman had passed this monk, he was contemplating bones and skeletons. And so he didn't see a woman, but just what he saw was a skeleton walking along. So that's what he said to um, this man, that I didn't see any woman, I just saw a skeleton. So this is um, samatha, kamatana as well. But when we see those bones um, break up and disintegrate, that's when wisdom arises. And it's really not sure when that's going to happen. So we should train ourselves before contemplating this body as being a collection of elements, as something unattractive as being something inconstant and not self, is painful. And one day wisdom will arise, and there'll be this brightness that comes up. 
And then sometimes um, perhaps joy can arise from different um, situations. Maybe monks are giving a blessing or they're chanting certain chants and um, this rapture can arise. Or maybe um, the king offers some water, um, some blessed water to a monk and there's this great happiness that comes up in the heart. And we can gain energy for this, um, from this. And this energy can help us to give rise to more peace, to contemplate more. So we should consider ourselves lucky that we have this opportunity to practice, that we have the Dhamma, we live in countries that have the Dhamma. And this Dhamma is able to clear away all things, it's able to give rise to peace. You see in this present day how there are many very violent and powerful weapons um, in the world, but the Dhamma arising in the world, it doesn't give rise to any danger whatsoever. When the heart is with Dhamma, then it's not chaotic, it comes to peace. Even though there may still be some suffering in the mind due to craving, there, um, there's still some worries about people we may have love or hate uh, towards uh, some people. But we see how that that is normal, that having been born, then uh, our lives must go on to death. And this is something that's necessary for us to go through. But when we view this in terms of Dhamma, we see that that's just something normal that's occurring. So this is something that we need to contemplate. And um, something that the Buddha said that monks should contemplate is how we must be separated from the things that we like, the things that we love. Because when these bodies are devoid of breath, then they die, even though we don't want to die. And most people are afraid of death. But we can ask ourselves, how many times have we died before? And how many times have we been afraid of that before? How many times has this happened in our previous lives? We can't count, it's just so many. So why then are we afraid of death if we've done it so many times before? And we should try in this life to not be afraid of death. Even though maybe we haven't seen the Dhamma, can we try to die without fear? Because it's necessary for us to die. So therefore, before that happens, we should build up a lot of goodness. To be ones whose lives are imbued with generosity and virtue. Uh, to be really firm in this kindness and generosity and uh, developing our minds. And to do this to the fullness of our efforts before we pass away. And even though we need to die, we shouldn't be afraid of that death. And so may you really be intent on this and practicing um, in this way. Because we should um, understand that the Dhamma is able to solve all our problems. It's able to clear away the defilements. And for people who have wisdom in the world, um, they can use that to develop things like weapons that can create a lot of chaos and destruction. But wouldn't it be better for us to destroy our defilements? And that's what we're doing as practitioners. So may all of you uh, prosper in the Dhamma.